So the title of my um, presentation is a review of endothermal laser therapies. So there are there has been several different techniques that has been trialed in the past several um, years, such as um, surgical stripping. Currently, there is um, endovenous laser ablation, radiofrequency ablation, endovenous steam ablation available. The history of endovenous laser ablation occurred with Carlos Bone. Um, he initially indicated that he was successful with um, such procedures um, in, I believe it was 1998 and um, 1999. The evolution and introduction of endovenous laser ablation, the first result of endovenous laser ablation was in patients with varicose veins were published in 2000. The first publicly available animal experiment was in 2002 by um, the author Wies. Um, there was another um, animal experiment by um, um, Min et al. who used porcine veins. The first randomized controlled trial comparing endovenous laser ablation to standard of care, such as Strippin, was published in 2005. Studies assessing the work in me mechanism of endovenous laser ablation and the effect of different laser parameters were also considered. Um, so as I mentioned, there was a comparison of endovenous radio frequency versus 810 nanometer diode laser occlusion of large veins in an animal study by Wies et al. Um, and they monitored the temperature rate um, this was a particular study by Navarro et al. titled Endovenous Laser, a Minimally Invasive Method of Treatment for Varicose Vein. Um, they found that most of the patients that they treated um, had um, fully um, ablated um, uh, lower extremity um, lower extremity veins when they treated the patients. I believe it was 40 patients and 33% had 100% occlusion rate. So comparing lasers versus strippin, um, this particular study had 20 patients with bilateral lower extremity um, venous insufficiency. Uh, the right lower extremity was treated with endovenous laser, and then the left lower extremity was treated with stripping. Patients reported same pain on both sides, but less swelling, less bruising on the laser-treated limb. So the word laser is an acronym for light amplification by stimulated emission of radiation. The active medium contains um, the atoms that produce the electromagnetic radiation. This type of active medium usually gives the laser its name. And for medical application, it includes gas, li liquid, crystalline material, semiconductive materials, and liquid um, dye solution. Therefore, whenever the electrons are excited, they're um, moved up to a higher energy state. Um, and then over time, they move back to the um, back to their energy state, but still surrounding the nucleus. So the unique properties of laser is that the light is a straight line compared to an ordinarily light that spreads in different directions. And with monochromacity, the wave um, is completely straight versus many different wavelengths. Um, the laser beam has a single wavelength. And coherence basically focuses on the frequency. So with lasers, the frequency um, is the same frequency compar um, con um, compared to ordinary light. So components of a laser, um, there are three, the active medium, energy source, and resonant chamber. The active medium um, consists of the atoms um, in, the, in the partic um, this particular cavity, and the 
um, re resonant source, the energy source is the energy provided to this, this active medium. And the resonant chamber consists of two mirrors. The left mirror is totally reflective and the right mirror is partially reflective. It the right the right side of the mirror allows the um, the atoms to emit and exit um, out of the partially transmitting uh, mirror. And here is a video. An ordinary light source produces many different wavelengths of light that go off in all directions. A laser is able to generate light waves of a single wavelength, all in step with each other and all traveling in the same direction. This makes laser light pure in color and extremely intense. The first laser was made of a ruby rod, mirrors, and a xenon flash tube. Intense light from the flash tube excites electrons in the ruby's chromium atoms. The electrons are raised to higher energy levels. As random electrons fall back to lower energy levels, particles of light called photons are emitted. When photons from the chromium atoms strike other excited atoms, they cause new photons to be emitted that are identical to the first. The laser light is amplified as photons traveling back and forth between the mirrors intensify the reaction. The light that we use leaves the laser through the partially silvered mirror. Therefore, lasers produce photons of electro electromagnetic energy that can vary in different wavelengths, such as a UV, visible, and infrared. Most of the endovenous lasers are within the near-infrared group, um, 700 to 1400 nanometers. With tissue ablation, the absorption of light is necessary for the laser to have any effect upon the tissue. Molecules that absorb light are called chromophores, which is basically um, part of the molecule responsible for its color. Um, it includes melanin, oxyhemoglobin, bilirubin, and water. The effect of the tissue converts to other forms of energy, such as photothermal, photoablative, and photochemical. The ability of light to penetrate a tissue and deposit energy um, in tissues is key to therapeutic applications. In this context, the knowledge of the optical properties of various biological tissues is mandatory. Therefore, the parameters used to characterize the optical properties of the tissues are the absorption coefficient, the single scattered coefficient, the transport coefficient, and the phase function. The major contribution of blood optical absorption is due to hemoglobin, both in its oxygenated and deoxygenated forms. So um, as you can see in this particular diagram, the oxygenated um, op part, which is in red, the peak is between 400 nanometers and 600 na nanometers. And then the deoxygenated peaks between 400 nanometers and 850 nanometers. Beyond 1000 nanometers, water absorption begins to dominate over hemoglobin absorption. The higher the wavelength, the greater the affinity of water absorption. As laser technology evolved, 810 and 940, as well as 980 nanometer wavelengths, each were the most optimal wavelength for thermal damage to veins, which has a stronger absorption coefficient to hemoglobin. Um, as the market evolved, 1,320 nanometers and 1,470 nanometers um, wavelengths were introduced generating a new theory about how lasers work. Water-specific lasers are hypothesized to produce um, intimal damage by interstitial water in the vein wall, utilizing water as a chromophore 
uh, to absorb laser energy. Therefore, the higher the wavelength, the greater the affinity of water absorption. There are certain important laser parameters we have to consider. Um, wavelength, for example, the, the wavelength of the laser beam determines the degree of tissue penetration absorbed, energy, and scattered energy. Energy is um, specified as joules, and power is specified as one watt equals one joule per second. The power describes the rate of energy delivery measured in joules um, per second, as mentioned earlier. The most important aspect of laser parameters for endovenous laser is the linear endovenous energy density measured in joules per centimeters. It was proposed by Pro Probestel et al., I believe in 2004, which was defined as a measure of energy delivered to vein wall in joules per centimeters of the treated vein. So um, the abbreviation is also lead. So the lead could be calculated by setting the power of the device and the pullback rate. So as noted here in this example, if the total energy deployed in um, if a treated vein was 1000 joules and the treated vein length was 20 centimeters, you could um, calculate your lead by dividing the total energy over total treated veins, <clears throat> and then it would be 50 joules per centimeters. As the evolution of endovenous laser ablation treatment evolved, now the question was how to determine optimal lead setting. There has been several articles evaluating low lead versus high lead. Um, intimal studies determined that lead greater than 80 joules per centimeters resulted in effective results compared to lead um, 60 joules per centimeters. This was by Timperman et al. in 2004. But in this particular article, Panier et al., they evaluated a 1470 nanometer laser and reported a 100% success rate with an average lead of 107 joules per centimeter um, for the great saphenous vein treatment. In the limbs which received um, a lead greater than 100 joules per centimeters, there was considerably higher incidence of paresthesia, noted here, which was 15.5% compared to the leads um, that um, compared to the veins that had leads less than 100 joules per centimeters. Um, Kaplan et al. also suggested an optimal consensus lead um, to obtain the best closure rate with least side effect at at least um, leads greater than 80 joules per centimeters and less than 95 joules per centimeters in terms of optimal lead, um, optimal closure rate. Now, comparing laser power and lead outcomes, Sanja et al. Um, published this article in 2019. It was a retrospective single center cohort study. Um, the objective of this study was to describe the relative contributions of power output, linear endovenous energy density, and pullback rates in determining successful long-term occlusion of the truncal saphenous veins after endovenous laser ablation. Um, they used a vena cure, um, 14 centimeter nanometer um, laser at a power settings of six to 12 watts in continuous output. They found that with the power output greater than 10.34 um, and a lead greater than 26.56 joules per centimeters, they generated greater than or equal to 90% probability of long-term ablation success. Pullback velocity had no overall effect on long-term success, except when the lead was greater than 26. Um, however, they also noted that once the lead exceeded 26, pullback rate influenced results with faster pullback rates. Um, they in turn recommended a a uh, pullback rate of two to four millimeters per second to achieve appropriate closure.
um, modes of operation, there are continuous and pulsed um, um, laser emitting energies. So continuous wave laser emits a continuous laser beam provided the pump source is switched by the operator. And then the pulse laser emits energy in the form of brief pulses rather than continuous pulses. Um, although certain articles such as article by Morden et al. Um, utilize mathematical calculation, they demonstrated that both the pulse and continuous mode operations of laser were efficient. They also observed that less amount of energy was required in the pulse mode than in the continuous mode. Um, however, the issue with the pulse mode was that it required precise positioning of the fiber after each pullback, and the duration of treatment was much longer. Therefore, they indicated that um, providers uh, prefer the continuous versus the, um, um, the pulse mode. There's been several different mechanism of action considered. Um, although the thermal vessel wall injury is an intended consequence of laser ablation, the exact mechanism has not been fully identified. Um, although several mechanisms has been suggested. The first proposed mechanism was direct absorption of scattered laser energy into the vessel wall, resulting in direct heating and damage to the vein wall. And then the second proposed mechanism was that the blood around the fiber absorbs the light and conducts the heat away from the hot tip of the fiber. Consequently, the heated blood or bubbles caused by evaporation of water in the blood um, conducts the heat to the vessel wall. The last theory was direct contact of the exceedingly hot tip of the fiber with the vessel wall. I believe um, all three of these mechanisms may also contribute to endovenous laser ablation. And then we have different types of lasers. Um, the bare fiber tip noted in the left upper corner was the most commonly used fiber. Um, it consisted of three layers, the, uh, the core, the cladding, and the jacket. At the distal part of the fiber, the jacket can be removed over a length of about five to six millimeters to expose the bare cladding. Um, the tulip tip um, has uh, a tip, um, has a bare fiber tip too, but eliminates contact to the vein wall. And, um, ha and it has a geometric um, constraint. The never touch tip is similar to the, um, the bare fiber tip. Um, however, there is a tube that wraps around the fiber tip um, and, ha and, and it has a lens that has been placed over the distal tip. Um, this causes the emitted light to be more divergent. The radial um, emitting laser is the one that's frequently used nowadays, and it is um, it has a quartz tip, um, which with a cone shape in order to reflect and broaden the laser light in a radial direction. So how does laser compare to radio frequency ablation? This particular randomized control trial um, consisted of endovenous laser therapy, radio frequency ablation, USG, and tripping. They utilized a 14 centimeter diode laser, um, 980 diode laser, and um, they used the bare tip. Um, in regards to the radio frequency, the temperature was maintained at 120 degrees um, for 20 seconds per seven centimeter segment. What they found at one year was that there were seven patients who had failure rate in the laser group and six patients who had failure rate in the RF group. Um, in regards to complications in the laser group, Paresthesia was noted in three patients, and in six patients, um, paresthesia was noted in an RF group. For pain scoring, the laser ablated group had more pain 
um, from day one to day 10 than the radio frequency ablated group. And then lastly, um, time to renew, um, resume normal activity. It took about two days for the laser group to resume activity compared to the radio frequency group, which was about one day. And then how does laser compare to radio frequency ablation at five years? This particular article was also a randomized controlled trial looking at five years later. It compared endovenous laser therapy, RF, USG, and stripping. Um, they noted that there were, there were no difference regarding clinical reoccurrence between the RF, laser, and stripping. However, there was a higher rate of recanalization with the USG group. And then um, this was an observational cohort study comparing 69 performing um, perforating veins in 55 patients. Um, they were looking at the benefits of um, treating perforator veins. In all the perforator varicose vein, um, occlusion um, with elimination of the reflux could be demonstrated immediately after the procedure. Um, after about one month, there was 95 to 6% of 95.6% um, of the treated veins were still occluded. How about AAH GSV treated with lasers? This was an article by Thiva Kumar, I believe, um, in 2009. The study was assessing the safety and short term efficacy of AAH GSV. Um, with laser treatment, um, as well as the preservation of uh, GSV, although the SFJ had reflux. Um, in conclusion, they found that when they spared the GSV and treated the AA GSV with reflux, um, they completely abolished the SFJ reflux um, that was associated with incompetence. Um, and overall improved scores um, similar to GSV um, laser treatment after one year. And then lastly, um, the retro this retrospective um, review of patients undergoing laser therapy focused on GSV, SSV, and AAGSV. Um, they had a total of 732 ablations and it was an 810 nanometer laser. The endovenous laser therapy of large veins, um, SSV and AHGSV was shown to be safe and effective. Um, specifically with the SSV and the AHGSV, they noted an acceptable success rate of about 80%. However, the AHGSV had a higher failure rate of 13.2%. But when we compare this with the um, Tiva Kamar um, article, he had a significant closure rate um, in their article. So in conclusion, laser ablation leads to long-term vein closure rates similar to RF and stripping. The water-specific laser wavelength of 1320 and 1470 um, leads to sp um, significant less pain and analgesia use. Um, when we perform laser ablation, it is best to aim for a lead greater than 26 joules per centimeters for a 90% uh, a probability, probability of treatment outcomes. And then even with the 1470 nanometer laser um, compared to RF, laser ablation causes higher pain scores and longer time to resume normal activity and, um, and work. And then that's pretty much it. Well, thank you, Dorcas. That was a very well presented uh, presentation with a good review of the literature. Uh, just one thing, uh, just to add to your knowledge base, that Rasmussen randomized trial where you presented the one-year data, mm -hmm. he's, he's followed up with it now. He now has five-year data from that same patient group. Okay. So, he, so later this afternoon, I'll give you the article so we can review it together. Yes, sir. Any, any questions for Dr. Lomo? So, um, I've got a, just a general question for the group, um, just based upon what's been presented here by Dr. Lomas, is it, just as a general question to the group, 
Do you feel that there's a need for having laser at all at this point, considering all of the other technologies that we have available? Is there any benefit to even having laser in our clinics? I would, Ken, uh, I would actually say uh, from my patient population standpoint of view, uh, I have a lot of self-pay patients. I think uh, lasers kind of uh, offer that entry point uh, because of their lower cost. Uh, I think they also play a nice role in uh, veins that are recanalized, and there is sometimes uh, a scar tissue or thrombus, a, and you can actually uh, slide a laser fiber through that uh, to retreat those areas that are needed a lot more uh, successfully than anything else. Sure, you can go with Veratina, but if I'm having somebody recanalize, uh, I think I want to go for a more definitive uh, closure. Uh, with thermal then to have uh, treatment with veratina. That, that's my my observation. So that's where I use it very selectively for. Yeah. Dr. Pravosti? Go ahead, Lewis. Your hand, I see your hands up. Good morning. Thank you. Um, two questions or comments. One is about uh, the lead. Um, I have been using a, uh, a lead for the 1470. I've been using a lead of about 40 to 50. Um, and it was my understanding that for uh, the water, uh chromo four lasers, such as uh, 1470, uh, that a lower lead rather than like 80 to 100, uh, more like 40 to 50. Any, uh, any, um, thoughts or comments? Is that reasonable um, or not? So the two studies that I've read about lowering the lead with the higher wavelength, allegedly the water wavelengths are supposed to cause less post-op pain. There was two studies that were done by Probstall uh, on very small series, which I, I didn't see a big difference in the post-operative pain. But what Probstall did say is that when you lowered the lead to less than 40, you have higher failure rates. So some people were looking at leads of 30 and 40 to try to see if they can decrease the amount of pain that's associated with the laser fiber. But when they went that low, they had higher failure rates. Now, mind you, that's two studies. They were small studies, so I don't know. But I don't think it, it's been really looked at well, that question. So yeah. I, I guess the real question is you have to look at your own personal failure rate and determine if those leads are actually working for you. If they are, then don't change it. Yeah, oh, they, they have, and I've noticed um, uh, less discomfort and uh, to my knowledge, uh, no or very, very minimal um, recanalization. The second uh, question or comment I had about the, uh, the usefulness of, a, of, of laser ablation is that uh, one advantage that I find, uh, and I may be 5% of my ablations are laser-based, uh, are for perpetrators and for very small sections of particularly, say, the AAGSV or other sections where you're, you really are sort of spot building the vein as opposed to a long linear ablation. and uh, the minimum ablation you can do length with, with RF is three centimeters. Uh, but with a laser fiber, uh, whether it's a perforator or some other section, I mean, you can literally spot weld a single point. So, um, so I would say, at least for my practice, the way I practice it, I am glad that <clears throat> I do have a laser around, albeit very, I use it once in a while. Very good. Dr. Leskis? Uh, I was just going to mention the same thing that Dr. Uh, Pervalsti just uh, said. Uh, for the laser, I think for perforators, lasers are exquisite uh, uh, to close um, small length perforators. Uh, I find them much, much more precise than the uh, Metronic radio frequency stylet, which is in my mind a, a harpoon, and secondly for the um, for the anterior accessory veins, again the the low small length you can really spog weld it uh, readily. So I I would uh, second 
the idea that we should still maintain the laser and, and we use it very infrequently. So um, that was my comment, thank you. Yes, I have a little bit different take on, on Ken's question. Uh, I almost exclusively use the laser on the small saphenous vein. When I looked at my own experience, looking back at my failure rates on the small saphenous vein, it was almost exclusively with the radio frequency fiber, radio frequency catheter. So I, I don't know if that's me or something that I'm doing wrong, but I almost exclusively use the laser on the SSV. And the other places where I consider using it is if it's a large diameter GSV. So anything above 12 to 14 millimeters, uh, I like the option of being able to deliver uh, a higher lead to the GSV on those large diameter veins to try to ensure a closure and minimize a, po a potential failure due to a large diameter. And then, of course, I agree with the comments on the AA GSV as well. Uh, anybody else? Any other questions? Ken? Thank you, guys. That's, that's helpful information. Anybody else? Dorcas, very, very nice presentation. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, I, I want to also agree with that. That was very, very thorough, Dorcas. Well done. So we'll Thank go over you. that one paper that I talked about later this afternoon. Yes, sir. Thank you. All right, everyone. Thank you very much. Have a great weekend, everyone. Take care. Thank you. Thank you.